Okay, today we are going to talk about herring, salmon, and orca whales, um, and sort of how those three species are, species are related, um, how that food web works, and some of the contemporary issues impacting those three very important species. Uh, the first one is Pacific herring. Um, Pacific herring are what's commonly referred to as a forage fish or a bait fish. Um, it's a fish that basically everything in the ocean uh, that's larger than it eats it. Um, and they are really important in the ecosystem. Um, when you think of like a food pyramid, um, not like the USDA food pyramid, like eat a bunch of grain, but like a trophic pyramid on the bottom, you might have something like grass, then something that eats the grass and then something that eats the things that eat the grass and kind of going up further and further and further. And so you have this, um, pyramid where there's more primary producers than there are consumers, things that eat grass or secondary consumers, uh, carnivores that eat herbivores in the ocean it can be a little bit different where instead of being this perfect pyramid um, it can be what we call a wasp waste so it starts really wide a lot of phytoplankton and it goes in narrow and then back out and that little narrow funnel part of the trophic pyramid um, are really important species that consume all the things down below and then get eaten by the things above so herring are one of those where they're eating um, primarily zooplankton um, and they're eaten by a whole bunch of other things. And so they are this important linkage in the, in the uh, food chain or food web of all of the little things, zooplankton, which are um, little animals that float around in the, in the ocean. So plankton meaning organisms that kind of go with the flow, that they go wherever the current goes. They don't they don't swim strong enough to swim against the current. So they kind of float along wherever the currents go, they go. And zoo, like zoo, meaning animals. So rather than phytoplankton, phyto being plant and plankton being, again, things that go with the flow, these are eating primarily zooplankton, things like copepods that go around and eat the, uh, eat the phytoplankton. So they are collecting all these zooplankton, turning them into fat tasty morsels, that which then other things eat, um, salmon, seabirds, um, common uh, or uh, harbor porpoises, things like that. So they're extremely vital in the food chain. Um, they're typically small, um, six to nine inches. Um, they mature at three to four years, which is actually a fairly old age for somebody who um, everybody's trying to eat you living to three or four years before you can uh, reproduce is, is a fairly um, older age and females produce between 20 and 40,000 eggs that's not uncommon in the marine world to have a single female producing that many eggs because the vast majority of those don't survive so you have to think for every female um, over their lifespan they need to produce two offspring that survive to uh, reproductive age and are able to successfully reproduce. And if each female produces 20 to 40,000 eggs, becomes mature at age three to four, can live to eight years, they might have three or four spawning events um, they're able to do. That's a ton of eggs and only two of those need to survive. So the vast majority of herring do not survive. Um, they get eaten at some point in their life stage. And again, their diet's primarily zooplankton, so the critters that um, are eating the phytoplankton, they're, they could be things like uh, crustacean larvae, crab larvae, things like that. They're primarily copepods, um, which are these cool little animals that go around and eat phytoplankton. They're little, uh, they prey on phytoplankton. Um, their life cycle, they start off as eggs. Um, females spawn in the shallow waters, they typically spawn even in the intertidal to the shallow subtidal, meaning like 
water is less than 30 feet deep. They typically spawn on a substrate, so they spawn on something, and that something is typically things like eelgrass, seaweeds, um, something like that. Sometimes directly on rocks, but that's um, not that's not typically the case. They typically spawn on something like that uh, for a few reasons. One is spawning on that, like a, a eelgrass or a seaweed. Those eggs kind of move back and forth. They get, they get oxygen um, running through them, so it's better for the eggs. Um, then they hatch into the larvae. They may still have a yolk sac attached, a little sac lunch from mom. Um, then on to juveniles and then fingerlings when they're um, sort of look like an adult, but they're not yet mature. Then they become sexually mature as adults, years three to four. Um, then they get a spawn if they're lucky for three to four years uh, before they, they perish. There's a link here. You can explore the... Uh, life cycle a bit more. And these spawning events are pretty extraordinary events. Um, that this is a herring spawn. So this is taken from the um, central coast of British Columbia, so north of Vancouver Island, uh, where there are still some intact herring populations. They're not as abundant as they once, once were, but they still have um, very large herring populations. And what you're seeing in here, all this white, is um, eggs and sperm, mostly sperm. So all the herring come together around a certain area. Uh, females start to lay eggs. Uh, males um, express milt or sperm. So much so that it turns, changes the color of the water. Um, and these are extraordinary events. You can see them from the sky. Um, and that's, in fact, one way that they used to track herring spawns. Um, is by aerial survey, just flying up and down the coast and looking for these big spawns. Um, and it's pretty impressive to think that we'll get into population declines and things like that, but this sort of site where the water is completely transformed by, you know, hundreds of thousands of herring um, coming together in this one small area to um, spawn would happen up and down the coast. And now it's just happening in kind of isolated pockets. Um, Hackai Magazine, which is a research group out of British Columbia, um, has done some cool work on herring. Um, and there's a video here. Um, I will pause and uh, cut this video in and we can watch that. Uh, so this is a short video by Hackai Institute showing the uh, SOK fishery. Um, and it's there's no sound, so I'll just kind of quickly narrate it for you. Um, you can see the boat behind them is is one of these punts, one of these aluminum boats. There's a line here. Tied to each line is a piece of kelp. And so you can see in the gentleman's hand is a kelp frond or like a blade of kelp um, from uh, called the California giant kelp, but Macrocystis. Uh... Oh, man. I forgot the species name, but Macrocystis is the genus. Um, so you can see them pulling the lines in. There's that, see him handing it up here, so look at this blade of kelp, now laden with herring eggs, and they lay it out, pause here, so you can see, these aren't the thickest ones, but these are pretty good, so you can see the kelp here, and you can see all the herring eggs here, and you can see just the spawn in the water behind them, all these bubbles are all herring spawn, piling them up, and then they cut them um, to a certain size, put them in a salted bucket, like a five gallon square bucket and that's typically what they're sold as like a bucket price cutting it here there you go that's a good one look at that so you can see the kelp on the inside and then that thick herring row oh those are delicious um so this would get again be salted um sold kept for personal consumption um or otherwise um otherwise used So it's a quick, quick little video. You can Google some more on the um, Heltic SOK. Um, this kind of gives you a, a quick, quick idea of what that looks like. That's 746. Uh, so as I mentioned, these are vitally important species for lots of other things. Um, anytime you're looking at a species that spawns multiple times, that's producing 40,000 eggs per spawn, you have to think, well, 
if every single one of those survived, the ocean would be nothing but herring, right? So for the vast majority of them, uh, life is not, uh, does not end so well. And so herring feed a variety of organisms at different life stages. And so when they start off life as an egg, um, birds near shore come and feast on these eggs. Their eggs are extremely nutritious. They're full of fat that females put a lot of their energy into these eggs. Um, so it's an extremely dense source of food. So the near shore birds come, eat as many as they can. Bears will come down, forage on the herring eggs. These um, eggs that are laid in the shallow intertidal, at low tide, they'll be exposed, attached to seaweed. Bears will come down and eat those. Marine invertebrates, sea stars and others, um, all um, come in and start devouring uh, these eggs as well. As well as benthic fish, this is an image of a rockfish here, consuming um, uh, eggs that are laid a little bit lower. And so depending on where the eggs get laid, if they're up in the shallow intertidal, uh, near shore birds, bears are a bigger concern. A little bit shallower sea stars and even shallower than benthic fish become to be an issue. And there's also diving birds that'll come in and eat the, the eggs as well. Uh, once they're um, smaller, uh, moving up through fingerlings in the kind of larval and juvenile stages, um, then smaller fish can eat them, pinnipeds. Um, any uh, piscivorous fish, which is a word for piscivore, it's a word for fish that eat fish. Um, any piscivorous fish uh, would be going after these small uh, herring. And once they start getting larger, um, a lot of your baleen whales will target um, herring schools, diving seabirds, salmon, um, any other large predator. And again, our friends the herring are consuming, these are copepods, um, these are big long antennae that they use to swim around. Um, these are zooplankton, so they're primarily eating zooplankton. And people interact with herring in a variety of ways. Mostly um, uh, for fisheries on both the egg stage and in the adult stage. Um, I'm going to first talk about the, the commercial fishery. Um, this is commonly referred to as the kill fishery. So herring, again, are, are these like nutrient-packed, nutritious little morsels swimming around the ocean. The kill fishery um, will target schools of herring, wrap them in a net, suck them out. Then they separate the females from the eggs and the real money, the real value of this fishery in an economic sense is in the eggs, the roe fishery. So the roe um, get sold uh, typically to be used for, for sushi and um, uh, mostly for the sushi market. But then you're left with all the males who don't have eggs and uh, the rest of the bodies of the females. Some, a, a minority of that would go into like a canned fishery, like you can buy canned um, herring. A minority of it goes to that. Uh, some goes to the bait fishery, so if you, you can buy a tray of herring frozen, if you want to go out salmon fishing, you can attach a dead herring to your lure. And then the rest gets um, ground up in the fish meal. That could be food for farm salmon. Um, it can be used for chicken feed. They can extract the uh, fatty acids out of it. So if you want to buy fish, fish oil uh, pills, it could be from herring. Um, or any other variety of sources that the oil and the fish meal from that has some value, but they actually make most of the money in the eggs. Um, and the other way of harvesting herring roe, herring eggs, is the, is the traditional fishery. Um, we'll go into that in a little bit more depth, but basically what you do is you attach a line to either uh, an anchor and a buoy or to shore. You run it offshore, attach it to another anchor and buoy, and then you hang things from it. Typically those things are uh, kelp. Um, you can do hemlock branches or um, uh, other tree branches, um, different types of seaweeds. Um, you hang it from this line and you put it out where you think the herring are gonna come and spawn. The herring come and spawn on the kelp you put in the water. You come back the next day, pull it up, 
Now you have all the herring eggs attached to this kelp, um, and you can consume that. Now, of course, those herring eggs are now not going to hatch and move on to the next generation, but the parents of those eggs are still alive, and they're going to spawn again the next day and keep spawning throughout the season, and then ideally come back next year and be able to spawn again. So when you're thinking about a fishery where you could either kill an individual that has their reproductive capacity of laying 40,000 eggs for three or four years, or you could harvest some number of eggs, but leave that individual who laid the eggs out there, you know, which one makes sense from a fishery sustainability standpoint. It would be like, if we want chicken eggs, we went around and killed chickens. Like, yeah, you might get an egg or two, but like not the, not the most, uh, economically or commonsensical way of going about it. The same sort of thing is, is the argument between the traditional uh, spawn on kelp fishery versus the kelp fishery. Shoreline development is a big issue. Uh, herring need healthy shorelines. They need um, clean water. They need those near shore seaweeds and sea grasses to spawn on. Um, as shoreline develop, ha develop, the, 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 the development happens, those things tend to go away, and so herring are losing their substrate to spawn on, as well as lights and other things are, are an issue. Um, tourism uh, is an interaction. Not that many people say, like, hey, let's go out in the boat and look at a school of herring, but they want to see the organisms that are consuming the herring. Um, marine pollution has been a big issue um, in some areas, uh, particularly, this is showing a, a large tanker, um, but the water quality is degraded to the point where herring won't come in to those areas and they won't spawn. One of the major sources of that pollution um, in many of the small bays up and down the coast are creosote logs. So when you want to put a, a piling in the ocean and attach a, a dock to it, uh, for a long, long time, you would take that log and you'd first completely soak it in tar. It's called creosote. Then you would uh, use a pile driver and put that piling in the ground. The reason for that is the creosote impregnates the log um, and makes it really resistant to rot. Well, what it's doing the whole time is it's then slowly leaching out all of that oil. And if you go into a lot of harbors or anywhere there's a lot of creosote logs on a hot day, you can actually see an oil slick behind those creosote logs. Um, that creates uh, toxicity in the water, and herring will not go into those areas and spawn. And they've actually shown where they go in and then wrap those creosote logs uh, with a protective cover that keeps the creosote out of the water, the herring will come back the next year or two. Um, it's pretty quick. Um, so that's a major issue is marine pollution. Uh, climate change is, of course, uh, a driver in our changing seas, um, changing both Ocean acidification is being, uh, is being shown to be a, a problem for herring survival, um, as well as um, warmer waters where the waters become too warm for the fish to spawn. Or also, again, thinking about a couple of aspects of their life stages that are limiting. They need places to spawn, and the zooplankton's gone, but they need the zooplankton to eat. Climate change is impacting both of those through warming seas and declining productivity. Um, and then management, this is the uh, Department of Fisheries and Oceanographer uh, herring manager flying around an airplane looking for, for spawn. So that's one way they manage the fisheries, just again, because you can cover a large area in a very short time. And when they spawn, it's so um, graphic, I guess might be the right word, but it's, it's so visible that you can go around and count spawns from the sky and get an estimate based on the size of the spawn, um, how many herring are out there. Now the traditional fishery um, is called uh, spawn on kelp or SOK. Um, it's a pretty interesting fishery, um, again, where um, a line is put out and kelp traditionally or hemlock, um, waga, which is a boa kelp, um, or the giant kelps are hung from this line, a little way at the bottom to keep them vertical. That's put out uh, just ahead of the spawn, and then you come back the next day and hope that you're, and you'll see some the video of it, you hope that you have this nice, big, fat, thick spawn. So you have a, a thin blade of kelp that's, you know, uh, as thick as like a cereal box cardboard, right? 
but then it'll spawn on with a with the with the eggs that could be like an inch inch and a half wide of just pure herring eggs. Now this has a big value both locally for traditional diets. Um, uh, herring roe is commonly served at potlatches and um, special events, as well as it's a major export market that these beautiful kelp blades, just thick, thick, thick with herring roe, are worth a, f a lot of money. And, and it's primarily an export market to Japan. Um, and as we mentioned prior, and this kind of ties it back in, prior a lot of the BC First Nations currently do not have a treaty. So unlike Washington State Treaty Tribes with the Bolt decision, they do not have a legal right to harvest fish and sell them. They have a legal right to do um, what they call ceremonial and subsistence fishing. So you can go out and harvest SOK, you can go out and harvest herring and halibut and salmon, uh, but you can't sell it. It's only meant for ceremonial and subsistence use. Um, well, a few members of the Heltzik Nation, which is north of uh, Vancouver Island um, in Bella Bella, have been, and others, had been harvesting SOK and selling it um, kind of in, a, in the back room of a bar in Vancouver, BC. This has been going on for quite a while. Um, Japanese buyers have come over, cash deals buy the SOK, export it to Japan. Uh, well, one guy got arrested, um, William Gladstone. And uh, people had gotten in a little bit of trouble, but not that much about this. That It was kind of one of those things where DFO didn't really want to, Department of Fisheries and Oceanography, didn't really want to get into the weeds on this one. They, like, they knew it was happening, everybody knew it was happening. It would be a big mess if somebody got arrested and, and took it. And fought the, the court case. Uh, and so supposedly it was a lower level DFO agent, but he arrested William Gladstone. The band, Heltzik, decided to back him in court. So they said, we're going to cover your legal expenses and we're going we're gonna to fight this thing. And so they wound up going through the court and they wound up uh, being seen by the Supreme Court of Canada. And the argument that Heltzik was making is that we have always harvested herring and we've always traded herring roe and herring. That that was something we were known for, and we've always done that. So this is not a new enterprise that we are proposing to engage in. This is something that we've always done. Well, the government said, no, your people never ate herring. Your people are salmon people, so you never ate herring. So this whole herring fishery thing is bogus. Um, and they were basing that evidence on, their, their main source of evidence, was archaeological literature and archaeological reports showing that in shell middens, which are the kind of like piled up, uh, the like less sensitive terms like trash heap. Uh, but you can imagine if you're subsistence eating, you have all this leftover fish remains, skeletons, uh, clamshells, deer bones, things like that. You would put them in a spot um, and over time that would pile up. Um, and that's called a shell midden. It's this discarded uh, kitchen refuge and things like that. Well, that's what archaeologists love to dig around in and ask questions of like, what were people eating and how much and what and how big were they? All of that comes from the faunal remains, the leftover bits of animals in these shell middens. Well, as an archaeologist, what you typically do is you go out and you dig up a bunch of this material and you screen it. You put it in a sieve. Um, and they're like, three feet by three feet and you shake it back and forth and little bits fall through and you're left with the big chunks. The old school archaeologists were really cared about lithics, arrowheads, things like that. Um, they didn't really care about little fish bones. So they used a really wide mesh. Um, it was about maybe half inch. I think it's half inch. Um, half inch by half inch squares. So most things kind of fall through. Even if you go down to quarter inch, lots of small things fall through. And so if you're sieving all this material, you're taking what's left on the sieve and you're looking at it and you're making inferences about what people did hundreds of years ago based on that material. All of your data is what's stuck on the screen, right? So everything smaller than a half inch falls through. So you see like large bones and you can say, well, they ate these animals because we found evidence of it. We found the physical remains. But what you didn't see are the small bones that fell through the mesh. 
such as herring bones. So some other uh, archaeologists, like Daniel Leposky from um, Simon Fraser University um, and some other really great folks, went back and said, well, let's sieve these sites with the wet sieves and let's sieve them down to like an eighth of an inch, like larger than screen door mesh, but not a lot. Let's go sieve these again and see what we find. And when they did that, they found that over half of the fish bones in these archaeological sites are in fact herring. So the government's telling the Heltzik people, you people don't eat herring, they never did. Their Heltzik are saying, yes, we did. Um, the government says, no, you didn't. They say, yes, we did. Um, and then the archaeologists, uh, Dana and et al., came in with, with these hard evidence as well, um, showing that, yes, uh, herring show up in massive amounts in these middens. Heltzik have story and evidence of trade of um, herring row going back to uh, for since time immemorial. And in the end, Heltz wound up winning that Supreme Court case, and they have the legal right now to harvest SOK, spawn on kelp. Um, and so that was a big, big piece, and they're now kind of going through for all the other fisheries and trying to do the same thing, but it's it's a hard road when for it to be successful, somebody has to get arrested and you have to go through a multi-year Supreme Court case. Um, but that's an interesting piece of the puzzle. Uh, there's a video here uh, that uh, will show some of this here. I'll pause and cut that in here. All of Area 7 is a no-go zone. We communicated this to DFO. The stocks are in recovery. They haven't reached a level of recovery which would allow this kind of fishing to occur. From 2006 to 2014, we had no fishery due to overfishing and mismanagement by the DFO. It caused the fishery to collapse. They seem intent on destroying all the stocks in our territory in Area 7. I think that the uh, forecasting methodology that DFO uses now for central ghost herring is, is actually quite flawed, unfortunately. They make uh, an assumption or another guess that in all instances, in all years, only half the spawn is being observed. So based on just that one point, uh, DFO's forecasts are likely twice as much as they should be, and that can result in, in significant over-harvesting of the catch. There's a big distinct difference between the way the uh, industrial fishery is harvesting and the way we are. The industrial fishery kills the herring to get the roe. But for us, we take the roe that is deposited on kelp and the herring live to spawn on another day. This is healthy territory. We believe in a sustainable fishery. Our community was misled. We weren't treated, you know, in good faith by, by DFO. You know, their, their actions, you know, of, of how that fishery opened with no notice to our community. How we feel is they did that so we wouldn't have enough time to go out and protest the fishery. The Supreme Court recognized our rights. I mean, those guys that were criminalized for practicing that right and then were vindicated by the courts and we still haven't gotten any satisfaction in this process, so what is it going to take? It's ludicrous to keep going back to the same industrial process. We have been a witness to the boom and bust of the herring and the salmon, and finally we've had to stand up for the herring and ourselves, and we're the ones that are being criminalized. People need to ask themselves, what's really happening here? Because we always get characterized as um, anti-development or being terrorists, but what we're doing is we're standing up for the resources because we're closest to it. The uh, gillnet fishery will be happening at any time within the next few days. Our community is mobilizing 
Uh, we're, we're not going to allow what happened last night to happen with the gillnet fishery. Um, and the kill fishery is the um, kind of opposition to that. That's the other fishery that's happening. Um, there has been a really a, a big fight about this has played out in Bella Bella. Um, this is this map kind of shows it here in north of Vancouver Island. Uh, just if you know where Queen Charlotte Islands or Haida Gwaii is, it's just in and a little bit south, but just basically in from that. Um, just a really cool spot. I've, there's a bunch of work up there a few years ago, um, but Bella Bella, the Celtic people. Okay, now we're going to look at this um, issue of who is actually doing this kill fishery. It's pretty interesting that um, the way that herring licenses were issued in British Columbia, and it's not unlike many other fisheries, that, that when you have an overcapitalization in a fishery, when you have too many boats out there fishing, one of the first things you can do to reduce effort is create what's called a limited entry fishery. So what they do is they say, okay, they've got too many people. Anybody can buy a boat and start doing this fishery, and there's just too many of you all. We need to get fewer. So we're going to look at your log books, look at how long you've been fishing, and then we're going to issue everybody a piece of the pie. You're going to issue everybody a um, uh, an ITQ, an individual tradable quota. So if you've been in the fishery for a long time and you've been catching a lot of fish, you might get 1% of the total allowable catch. So let's say DFO says you can catch, we can catch 100 million pounds of herring. I, if I have a 1% ITQ, I own, I can, I have the legal right to harvest 1% of that total, or in this case, it would be 1 million pounds. Um, and I can trade it. I can sell it like a stock. So if I've been engaged in the fishery and I'm kind of getting older and my kids don't want to do it, this share of the total fish that are allowed to be caught has value and I can sell that. And so what you see is over time, it's when the stocks were issued, lots and lots of people are engaged in the fishery. And over time, as it becomes less fish, people age out of the fishery, um, they move on to other things. This ITQ has a lot of value and people sell them. And over time, what we've seen is the ownership distribution change. It's, it's pretty interesting. Um, I'm going to jump over to this website and we're going to look through that. Okay, I'm going to run this animation a few times and we'll talk about it. But this is the constellations of herring. So each dot um, on this is an individual um, ITQ that we were talking about. And so this shows who owns them. And you can see there's this little grouping down here. And we'll run through the animation a few times and then talk about it. So if we restart it, you see all these, these are all individuals who own an ITQ. And over time, there's this one that's been glommed on here where, so let's run that again. So each dot is an ITQ. Um, the blue dots are people and the other colored dots are um, the uh, the actual quota, the share of the amount of fish. And so it starts off even, and then this big amoeba comes in and like buys up a whole bunch of it. So we went from this system where everybody had a small piece of it to where there's one in, there's one big giant, ginormous blob over here, and there's a couple smaller ones around. So let me see if I can get this to work here. Um, so here's Arctic Pearl Ice and Cold Storage Limited. So that makes sense. They're a fish processor. They own a small share. Say the Sea Fishery Society. This is, um, I believe, a First Nations consortium. And so for a lot of the First Nations to engage in this fishery, they have to buy a quota. They have to buy an ITQ just like um, uh, a non-Indigenous person would because they don't have the treaty right to engage in this fishery. So frequently the band will, will buy permits and then um, issue those to their membership to go out and fish. Sea Star Holdings, who knows what that is. DFO, Pacific Phi Inventory. So, so DFO might have to own their own uh, share. They engage in a, a research fishery. Pharma Fishing Company Limited. Hmm, okay. What is this? 
Let's get an individual. Central Coast Fisheries Association. So the same sort of idea here. So these colors could be First Nation, South Pack, Couch and Tribes, and the First Nation. So let's look at some of these larger ones here. Native Fishing Alliance, James Watson and Walkus, Hokomium. Okay, who's this? What's going on here? So this is the Jim Pattison Enterprise and, and Subsidiaries. Jim Pattison is an extremely controversial figure um, in British Columbia. Um, he owns the vast majority of the fishing uh, licenses for herring. Um, he also owns a, like, a bunch of radio stations, a bunch of car dealerships, um, a bunch of grocery stores, much of the Save on Foods on Vancouver Island. Uh, and generally has had some anti-environmental and anti-First Nation stances. Um, and so I encourage you to look him up and kind of see what, what um, has been written about him. But he owns the vast majority, or he owns a good percentage of the herring fishing licenses. And why that's important is um, with these permits, they're often use it or, or lose it. And so... If you have an ITQ and you haven't used it for five or six years, there's a chance that you could lose it. Um, and so the thought is that perhaps he sends boats out to go fish, even when it's not economically viable, meaning that um, he owns the permits, doesn't necessarily own the boats, but you would contract with the boat to go out and fish your permit. You could tell that boat, I want you to go out and fish my permit, and if they say, well, we're not going to make enough money to cover our costs. And if you say, well, I'll cover your costs if, if you don't catch enough fish, just so we're still engaged in the fishery, we still have a seat at the table, that our, our permit is still alive because we believe in the future there'll either be more fish or they'll become more valuable or having these permits alive somehow has value. Um, so you'll see that. And you'll also see one boat can fish multiple permits. And so if there's a boat going out, they can contract with a variety of other permit holders and say, I'll go fish your permit and we'll work out some kind of share. I, I don't know what it is. 50, 50, 30, 70 of the amount of fish caught. Some goes to the permit holder and some goes to the boat owner and the boat owner's share is broken down by the crew. So it's an interesting thing where it's one individual really controlling the vast majority of the permits that um, is probably a non-intended um, aspect of these ITQs, these individual tradable quotas that are really common now in fisheries management and, and do have a lot of benefit because it helps create incentive where um, instead of that tragedy of the commons idea where there's just a whole bunch of fish and I'm going to get there first and I'm going to catch them all first. If you know that you have a certain quota, um, you don't need to all rush out and fish them at the same time. In the halibut world, it's actually been really beneficial. So halibut used to be open for like a couple days. Everybody would go out, try to catch as many halibut. You would buy the biggest boat, burn the most fuel, um, throw the most amount of resources at it. And then all this halibut hits the market all at the same time. So then the price of halibut goes way, way, way down. Well, if you know at the start of the season, you have a, a quota of 10,000 pounds. Now the whole economics have changed. You don't want to go out and catch them all on day one you want to figure out how to go out and catch them in the most economically uh, valuable sense, or the most e economically, in the most economic sense, meaning the smallest boat possible, least amount of fuel possible, least amount of gear possible. And you want to spread that out because you want to be able to provide fish to the market maybe around holidays or around times when um, you can get a better price for it. So now the market's not flooded with tons of halibut all at the same time. You can go out and catch a few fish at a time, you can start high grading your fish. You can start selling them fresh to restaurants, which gets a much higher price compared to selling them to a, a fish processor that's just going to wholesale them and turn them into all kinds of different halibut products. So you can really start to get more economic value out of that fishery. And you're going to, you know, keep an eye on your neighbors more so too. If somebody's out, you know, fishing under the table or, or fishing them they shouldn't be, you're kind of more likely to take that as a personal insult versus if it's the tragedy of the commons. It's like, well, hey, man, everybody's got to get their own because, you know, it's a, it's a free-for-all. So there are a lot of examples of ITQs working properly. 
um, the consolidation of ITQs by one or two individuals that then wield um, a disproportionate amount of power in the fishery is an unintended consequence that we've seen in other other fisheries. But it's an interesting thing to think about when the herring fisheries, and particularly watching those videos about health sick in the in the conflicts, um, it's really driven by like one or two stakeholders in the um, herring kill fishery. So that's a bit about mostly the British Columbia fishery. And, and the reason for that is that fishery is still quite active. Um, the fisheries here in Washington, as we'll learn about, really are not as active as they once were. And so looking at how these issues are playing out in British Columbia makes sense. Um, granted, you know, the health sick Bella Bella examples are north of the Salish Sea. And again, because that's where these fisheries are, are occurring now because they've been so depleted throughout the Salish Sea. And so it's an example um, that's worth drawing on, and it really shows this, these conflicts, um, I believe, quite nicely. Um, these are commercial landings of Pacific herring in U.S. waters of the Salish Sea by all methods. So these are U.S. landings. Let me move me again here. Um, in a few different categories. One is SOK, um, so that's the spawn and kelp we talked about. Sack row, that's the kill fishery, catch the fish, kill them, take the uh, row and sell that. Reduction is boiling these things down for fish meal. Um, really smelly, but it was like a big, a, a, a big product for quite a while. Fertilizer, things like that. Um, it's kind of crazy to think about a little fish that can have so much value, um, like particularly in the SOK market, where the fish aren't killed, is like one way of managing or using this fish. And another way is to catch millions of them and grind them up and turn them into fertilizer. Like, it seems kind of like one a little more than the other. Um, and sport bait. So this is catching herring, so fishermen can buy little packs of it and go fishing. <clears throat> um, these are a number of tons. These are the years. So back in the 60s, we were all about catching herring, boiling them down in a fish mill, selling it as fertilizer, pig feed, things like that. A little bit of sport bait fishery. And then the sack row fishery really took off. And this is when the herring fishery really started building up. People were making, uh, with a little skiff, um, what's common, uh, the common boat in the central coast is called a, um, a punt. And they were literally made by the manuf same manufacturers who made uh, dump truck beds because they look almost identical. They're about 22, 24 feet long, 7 feet wide, and just a box. Just a flat bottom, no flotation, nothing. Just a square box with some little compartments in it, and that's it. Like, like no deck to stand on, nothing like that. Just a big square box. You take it out, catch a bunch of herring, fill up the hold, um, motor back with the whole boat laden down about the sink, um, and sell your herring. And folks were making over $100,000 a year in this fishery, the folks that got in early, with just this little tiny boat and a little single motor. Um, then the whole fishery really exploded because there was all this money in it. It was uh, open entry. It was really easy to get in. And shockingly, then the fishery um, dramatically collapsed. Um, in the early 80s. And so the sacro fishery ended in the early 80s. Um, there was a small SOK fishery that didn't last very long in the late 80s, early 90s. And then the sport bait fishery has continued uh, to some extent. And so there's still a few sport bait licenses out there. But what we're seeing is, you know, a fishery that was harvesting a lot but getting very little economic value out of it. There wasn't a whole lot of incentive to be in this fishery. Um, we're reducing herring for fish meal. Then the advent of a new market, herring row, the explosion of that fishery, massive harvest, and then the immediate decline of that fishery. So a pretty common like fisheries tale of like people are catching it, didn't have a whole lot of value. All of a sudden, it's worth a whole bunch of money. There's no barrier to entry. Uh, obscene amounts of money, new trucks, new boats, collapse, 
and then kind of disarray after that. Uh, here are, these are estimated spawning biomass of different stocks in Puget Sound. So this is interesting, it's showing, you know, this is all other stocks, Squaxin Island, Cherry Point, Hood Canal, Puget Sound Toad. Cherry Point, right near us, um, had had traditionally one of the largest herring populations in Puget Sound. Um, this is where the, all the refineries are, the aluminum smelter, coal terminal was proposed up there, lots of industrial activities in this area and it held one of the largest herring populations in the area. And it's interesting because it's a genetically different stock. And so um, the Cherry Point herring had fidelity. They would always go back to where they were born, sort of like salmon do, go back up the same stream. Herring will do the same thing too. They'll return to their natal spawning area. And so the genetics of the Herring Point herring, <laughs> genetics of the Cherry Point herring were a bit different than the other areas, showing that these individuals go back and go back and go back and don't just wander around and just spawn wherever looks good. Um, that they and they go back to their natal area where they hatched out as the legs, they go back there. And so this population uh, was, you know, and we have to think about shifting baselines um, and how things have changed. You know, these data do not go back to pre-contact. They don't even go back to World War II. They go back to, you know, the early 70s. So what that looked like prior, we really don't know. But at the time of these data, Cherry Point herring totaled more than all the other stocks. And even if you add in Hood Canal and Squaxin, Cherry Point still basically equal with that. So Cherry Point is the majority of the herring in Puget Sound. Cherry Point populations crashed. Um, you know, little blips here, but really crashed pretty dramatically in the in the late 90s and have not recovered, have continued to decline, that we see very, 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 very few fish spawning at Cherry Point. Um, it's a real, real issue. Um, you can see that sort of, tr you know, trajectory for all of them. And now this is in the absence of major fishing as well. So it's been a real conundrum that uh, here's a species where we've pulled back the pressure. We're not fishing really heavily on it. There's a little bit of sport bait fishery, but not a lot. And we haven't seen that recovery. It's, it's um, a massive concern. Um, and there could be many other factors happening that they could just, the populations could be so low that you still have the same predator pressure on them. So if, if there's like 100 of you and 10 get eaten every year by predators, you know, that's fine because you've got 10 or 15 new individuals entering the population every year. But if there's only 20 of you uh, and 10 get eaten every year by predators, there's only 10 left to make more, to make more herring, and they're not able to make that many more. And so you get caught in this bottleneck where um, the predators are just kind of swamping out your new productivity. Um, could be that. Could be the loss of um, substrate. Could be toxicity. Um, there's a bunch of issues around herring. Uh, this is a conceptual model of Salish herring used for a uh, qualitative network model analysis. And so this is just thinking about how do we quantify that? How do we think about what what's all happening to herring and, and how does that uh, impact them? Um, so we have adult herring and these are things that are eating them. So the arrows go Chinook are eating them. Piscivorous fish. These are fishes that eat other fish, dogfish, harbor porpoise uh Piscivorous whales and then how these things chinook go up and feed orcas um, herring eggs get consumed by egg predators they're also impacted by biogenic habitat loss meaning that loss of habitat we were concerned about uh loss of seaweeds and sea, sea grasses contaminants um herring are eaten by jellyfish microzooplankton um, they're eating diatoms. I'm sorry, they're, they're eating microzooplankton. The arrow's going towards them. Um, zooplankton are being consumed by juvenile herring, adult herring. Uh, they're also being consumed by um, other things as well. 
So it's interesting, since diatoms, which feed zooplankton, are impacted by turbidity, and the many areas of the state of sea are getting darker, are getting more turbid. Um, contaminants are impacting herring eggs. Uh, physical habitat degradation is impacting the, the, biogenic, the biogenic habitat loss. And so shoreline development reduces seaweeds and seagrasses, which reduce areas, the biogenic, biological habitat, is then lost for herring eggs to, to spawn on. So uh, it's pretty interesting to look at this whole web and how these different things are interacting. Um, this video is a bit long with the three videos in it. Um, so I'm going to break here and then I'll do a separate one, separate one for salmon and herring. Um, the big things to know here is I would, I'm really interested in the differences between the spawn on kelp fishery. Uh, I'm really interested in that and the kill fishery. Um, and I'm really interested in, um, sort of the decline, um, just knowing that this decline happened and that there's been a change in the way that um, fish have been caught, um, <clears throat> as well as just some basic kind of biological facts about, about herring. I think that's also really interesting.